Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, we follow Charles on his winding international investment banking career path. From undergrad at McGill to working as an IB analyst in New York, to attending HEC for his Master's of Science in Paris, to his eventual move to London. We find out why he jumped when he did, and how he survived the long hours to find the right firm where the culture was a great fit. Enjoy. All right, Charles, welcome to the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Thank you. How are you? I'm I'm hanging in there. So let's start off with just a quick summary bio so the listeners can kind of get a frame of reference here. Sure. Um, Just very briefly, um, did my undergrad in Montreal, Canada, um, and got my first stint in New York in a a fixed term contract. I did capital advisory and ratings advisory for a French universal bank um, that was back in 2011. Went back to Europe uh, after that one year because it was a fixed term contract. Uh, and got my master's degree at uh, HEC in Paris, um, where I did sort of hit a restart button on, on my career and did restart the analyst level. Um, two things I knew based on my experience in New York that I wanted to focus on was, one, did not want to work for a big universal bank. Um, I did enjoy advisory. I wanted to focus on advisory only and did not want to join a bulge bracket, just wanted to be very much focused on the advisory side of things. So pretty much only focused um, on boutiques at the time, um, did a few internships and a few studies internships after HEC. Um, one at Blackstone in their restructuring team, which eventually became PJT. Um, and then a small stint at Bridgepoint, which is a pan-European, well now global, um, European uh, private equity firm. Um, and got my first uh, analyst role at a global, but mostly European boutique uh, where I did spend two and a half years in Paris. I focused mostly on M&A, financing and restructuring advisory with the core focus being on, on sponsored transactions. And then got you know, moved after um, the end of my analyst cycle for another boutique, um, this one being an American one, uh, again, with a global footprint, but American at core. Um, this time more focused on financing and restructuring transaction. That being said, still very much exposed to um, M&A transaction as a whole. I spent three and a half years um, in the London office and moved to the New York office um, just in time for lockdown in early 2020. <laughs> oh my gosh, brutal timing. Yeah, so you're, you're now a VP there, correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's start all the way back. So why are you so global? Are, where are you from originally? What's the, what's the deal? Why, why have you gone, you know, you know Canada, <laughs> uh, Paris, London, New York now? I mean, you some awesome cities, but. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear. I don't have much of a global um, experience at the very, you know, uh, from a training perspective. Uh, I'm just a regular Frenchman who happens to um, speak a bit of English. Uh, there really is um, the story I did. You know, I was keen to do intentional studies. I think that was the one main trigger for me. And the exposure going to McGill uh, in, in Montreal was definitely a bit of a game changer for me because I, you know, I went from suburbia, Paris to um, a very international school. Um, and at that point in time, I think that it, it could open up my mind to um, different careers and also different cities when, um, you know, when thinking about my, my future career. So, um, so families being, and families in, in France and around Paris. And, and families in France, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the main reasons I was actually attracted to finance as a whole was that it was a very international career overall. You know, at the time, people were talking about how they went from Hong Kong to London to New York. And um, and the fact that the industry, especially banking for that matter, is very structured. So, you know, an analyst at a bank is going to be an analyst at another firm. You know, mostly what the tasks are going to be, you know, mostly what the uh, the pay is going to be, uh, made it very transferable as, as an industry. Um, and, and that appealed to me. Um, but tell and- me, I mean, you're, you're an undergrad right during the financial crisis. So what's going through your mind? Is it like you were like, I want to go finance in 07. And then all of a sudden you're seeing everything unfold in 08, 09. And you're graduating in 2010, right? So what what's going through your head? I mean, almost impossible to get a job then. 
right? That's a very good question. And uh, it was definitely a very um, unique experience in that aspect. When I joined, all of the, um, you know, um, all of the young graduates were talking about how they were going to Lehman and other institutions. And then or, you know, a couple months into uh, my undergrad, you know, everything went, went south. So it was tough. I'm not going to lie, it was very tough. Um, luck was somewhat on my side. Um, I think one good thing that I had was twofold. One, you know, one is um, it was a period of transition for the finance industry. So from 08 to uh, 2010, it was a bit of a adjustment period. So there were quite structural changes that happened in that period. And being a student, I, I was a witness of that. And two, being a student, I could also play the waiting game to some extent. And, and the second aspect being luck, which is, you know, I decided to voluntarily write a thesis when I was at McGill. Um, focused on the leverage finance industry and credit ratings, uh, which were partly to blame for the crisis. And I wanted to dive a bit deeper into this and somehow managed to find a job um, for a, a French universal bank that was looking for a leverage finance and ratings industry advisory um, analyst, ideally a Frenchman with an international background. So, you know, the odds of, I had that, I had that profile again. Yeah, and you wrote that up. thesis that was kind of dead on on what they wanted. Exactly. Did you did you write that thesis knowing that that would make you more attractive to potential investment banks? Not even. Uh, to be honest, not even. I the, the thesis was just under supervisory of one prof, and I said, you know, this is an area of interest to me, and the prof said, actually, that's an area of research for me, so it actually works pretty well. Oh, cool. And it just again, that's honestly that's pure luck. And being at a good school, being at a good school helps, in. right? Yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're. You're graduating, and do you have any internships lined up? So, 09, you're a junior. Yes, that's right. Did you have a summer analyst stint, uh, typical, or like how did your summers look like when you weren't when you weren't in school? Yeah. Um, so, as you pointed out, recruitment was very tough back then. I was a good student, but I was not a top student. Like three six, uh, three seven. What well, what was your GPA around? I think I got a three point four. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. So, yeah so, I'll, don't even make the cutoff for some banks. Okay. So you're you have no, double. No, for, sure, for sure. You have like a double whammy. You have um. You're at a great school, but you're at horrible timing, not the worst timing, but still pretty bad timing. And then the GPA is not not super high. Okay. Keep going. Um. I was not keen on going to Toronto. Um. I was not interested by Toronto as a city and as a career. So that you know, um, being at McGill was mechanically, uh. I was in a good school for, to go to Toronto, but Toronto not being on my um, hit list, um, it, it was very tricky for me to find, you know, an attractive summer internship program in, say, New York, London, for that matter. Um, so I decided to explore different options. I did a small venture capital stint in uh, in '09 um, in, in Montreal, um, which I really enjoyed. And the year before that, I did a small stint in the securities uh, services division of a uh, French bank in Paris. How did you get these internships? Uh, network, uh, network, all of them through network. One of the the first one through uh, people that I had met at the recruitment fair in Montreal, and knowing someone in France and putting me in touch. Uh, and the second one being same thing. Uh, a friend of mine had did a entrepreneurship recruitment firm uh, fair, sorry, and I did meet um, a partner in a VC firm, um, and we just hit it up. And tell me a little bit about specifically like that networking. You weren't, you, it doesn't sound like you were using LinkedIn heavily at this stage or anything like that. It was much more like the career fair angle and live personal connections and potentially friends. Yes, I think that's right. I think I was starting to use LinkedIn and I've always been uh, you know, a big user of LinkedIn. So early on, I used it. Um, it definitely helped to map out options and also to get a sense of what people were doing to get into those roles. I think especially when you don't have the background, like you have Wall Street Oasis today, which I think is a good platform to get that, that sort of insight. Uh, but at the time, I think, um, you know, LinkedIn did tell you, oh, people who did this, then why not to do that? So it feels like this is a good uh, um, platform. So I did use a bit of this, but of course, um, the best connections remain in in-person connections and, and fairs when people are actually, you know, legitimately coming to campus to hire are the best um, positions you can have. And they're not like, did you feel like they were super competitive though? Or did you just, how did you, how did you like make that connection such that like it actually translated to an, to an internship? Cause it's like, I guess the first one, it sounds like somebody back home knew somebody and they kind of put in a good word for you. 
Yeah, there was a fair amount of hustling. I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah, but, that's what um, I want to hear about. That's what I want to hear about that, like <laughs> angling and hustling. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's you know, you present yourself. I was one of the only kids at Miguel and people made fun of me at, of me at the time um, who printed his own business cards. And, you know, there's not much to say on it. You were that uh, guy. You were that but, guy. Okay. So you do you recommend doing that to kids right now? Print your own business card and hand them out? I wouldn't recommend it, and as and to your point, I think being, LinkedIn has become such a a big a big thing now that you don't need it. And on top of it, right now with lockdown, let's see a lot of of use for it. But that being said, um, it did put me as the one kid who took himself uh, maybe too seriously. And whether people liked it or not, it's still printed in their memory. Yeah, you know, oh, you know, it's that kid. You're that guy who had a had a business and card. Especially for my first gig, it was. It did. It did help to some extent. Well, not the the business card itself helped, but it did show myself as someone who was keen and very serious about funding. You were eager. Okay, first step. You were eager. So you, they almost thought it was more cute than anything. Like how eager you were. You think it, it? And that's it's. You stood out. You stood out. Exactly. I stood out. Uh, I'm not sure if in a good way or not, but I did stood out. And um, that's great. And people do like people who are keenly motivated, and that that is a motivation to convey. Okay, so besides printing your own business cards, any other kind of little things you did besides going to these job fairs? Were you were you being very aggressive about how you went up and talked to them and handed out your business card? Were you like, how are you, how are you acting? No, that's a good question. Uh, I think, especially for my first analyst role in, in, in New York, uh, the one thing that somewhat gave me some form of edge was, um, I would say, industry knowledge. I was keeping up with the news. I was reading a lot of deal book at the time. I was reading a bit of Bloomberg. I was using a lot of the university library resources because you get access to tons and tons of, uh, you know, either news outlets or, um, yeah, or any other sources for that matter. And you don't realize that in the real world, they're really expensive. Uh, like Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, but then also Bloomberg terminals. and Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, I had some some knowledge about what I wanted to do and the areas of interest to me. So, when you're fresh out of undergrad, you say, oh, I'm really interested in understanding why, you know, second lien loans have disappeared of typical LBO structures. People are like, oh, wow, this kid has done a bit of research. Uh, you know, uh, doesn't mean he's good. Doesn't mean, you know. What made that internal best, motivation? What, as an undergrad, that's pretty rare to have that level of knowledge. What, may, what, what do you think gave you that internal motivation? Were, was a, were your family in finance? How did you even know that stuff? No, I don't have family in finance, uh, which, of course, would have helped. Uh, and I can see when people do have family in finance because they have, you know, them the mechanics of a deal or, or just a, a lot of the vocab much, much faster. Um, to be honest, it was just reading. And then every time there was something that I thought was of interest, I would just dig a bit. Uh, you think and, it was because then, 06, 07 was like a hot time, like right when you were going into college that it interested you and you were like, wow, the pay is amazing. These kids are getting paid, you know, $150,000 right out of undergrad. So the pay is obviously an aspect of it. Um, to be honest, I mean, I'm not going to say it never matter. Of course, it does matter. But um, I don't know. There was something about uh, financial engineering, which I thought was interesting and wanted to dig. Uh, and being the, from a non finance background, I think it was just thirst of, you know. Again, one thing that is both was both a downside, but also an upside to uh, my time as an undergrad student during the financial crisis was there. There was a lot of changes around that time. So a lot of people were writing about, ooh, this was happening in 06 or in 07, and this has suddenly disappeared, or you know, tomorrow's deals are not going to be structured the same way. And I was like, oh, wow, why, why is that? Um, and I think that's just where it came from. Interesting. And so you're, you're kind of coming up, so your junior year, summer, you have an internship, but it's not like a typical investment banking summer analyst role. Yeah, that's right. So it was, remind me what that was? Uh, it was called Startup CFO in Montreal. Okay. So you're kind of coming out of that. And what's your game plan going into senior year? You're thinking, I'm not going to have a full-time offer. What do, what's your thought here? Yeah. So I finished my undergrad in December, 2010. So I did have a full year still ahead, which is a bit, a bit of a lie. Um, it was supposed to be a four-year program, but with the French baccalaureate, you do get some credit. And, um, you know, I was hustling as I was before. So you had six months kind of before you really graduated with nothing. That's right. Before you, you, you officially like were on site. So like you had almost no classes and you could do whatever you had to do to get a, get a job. Yeah, exactly. Um, I finished in, so I did an exchange at LSE and during my time at LSE, I did 
um, find this beautiful job offer on uh, the bank's website that I that was in New York. Um, and the job was starting in October when I was, could only start in January 2011. Um, and, you know, we hit it off. My profile was what they were looking after. I, the interviews went really smoothly and, and they accepted to wait for me for another two months, uh, well, two, three months. Mm-hmm. Um, so I literally finished school a couple of days before Christmas and got started in New York, uh, you know, a couple of days after New Year's Eve. Wow. And so that was, that was an analyst program more like capital structure and rating advisory type type work. So can you explain to listeners what that meant? Like what was your day-to-day? How was it different from like an M&A, pure M&A role? Yeah, so I think people tend to underestimate, especially coming out of school, how big the credit world is. Um, it's a bigger asset class overall than, than equities. Uh, so that means a lot of people uh, either investing in those fixed income instruments, whether that's loans or bonds. Um, and mechanically, there's a lot of, a lot of people on the sell side uh, who are advising or uh, or you know helping underwrite those instruments? Um, and it was again there was an area of interest to me having done a bit of my thesis around this and LPO structures were something of interest to me as well. Um, so my day to day was really advising. It was twofold. One was working with the leverage finance teams on structuring the LPO, so uh, helping them build out the models, and then once the model and the marketing materials that were prepared for the syndication purposes. Um, we would seek to optimize the structure so as to achieve a single B rating um, because banks these days don't really lend, they just underwrite and then they push the paper to other investors and, and for that paper to be sold, it usually needs to be in the single B uh, tranche from a risk uh, you know, risk reward perspective. Yeah. Um, yep. And the second aspect of my role was advising bigger corporates, some of them uh, you know, uh, some of them being investment grade on the cusp of investment grade um, that we're looking at both private market and public market options and also playing, looking at strategic options within the constraints of rating advisory. So you want to acquire this company and you want to raise X billion of debt. How is that going to impact your rating? Um, should you seek to you know, push? Do you have still room to push from a ratings perspective more debt to fund that acquisition or in, instead should you watch out for it because you don't want to get downgraded and, and refinance that? a higher coupon. So um, it was actually really interesting because 2011 was a bit of a seesaw year. Um, the first six months were, you know, somewhat back to business. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of transactions getting done, a lot of LBOs getting done. And working for a French, well, European bank in the summer of 2011, the Greek crisis hit, uh, which mechanically meant that a lot of those European banks being funded on the money market in the US uh, were overnight you know, uh, deprived from, from funding access. So working for a bank whose core model is, is about lending, but not being able to lend anymore proved to be quite difficult. So uh, quite a few people were uh, laid off during that, that second half. Explain it to me. So it's something happened, the Greek crisis happened. And so what got flipped upside down so that you guys couldn't lend anymore? The... So a lot of the um, larger uh, lending banks in, in Europe on, on the US market that do uh, fund themselves on the money market and, and US money market. Oh, they fund themselves, okay, US money market, yeah. That's right. And because of the potential exposure of the Greek um, debt crisis, that those money markets overnight just dried up um, for you know any large institution with sizable Greek exposure, which mechanically was the case for uh, a pan-European bank. Um, Got it. So it could be quite tricky. And mechanically, activity for my last uh, four months were was was much lower. Right. So you were really busy for the first six months, and then it kind of dried up. And so I, I assume that's why you're only there for about a year. Uh, yeah, that's one aspect. But it was a fixed term contract in in uh, the first instance, partly for visa reasons. Uh, it was a mini. Expat. Did you get a bonus at least? No, no, no. There's no bonus part of it. It's, it's called the VIE, which is a very specific French contract uh, allowing French. Well, actually, European um, students to work for European institutions in in New York, in New York or across US. the world, for that matter. It doesn't have to be the US. Okay, um, and that's how it's done. So you saw this as a potential time for a reset. That's right. So t- talk to me a little bit about what your thought process was. Why not go to get an MBA? Why go to back back home? Yeah. Um, in hindsight, I I could have 
you know, I could have explored different options. Um, I did take my GMAT when I was in undergrad, which gave me a bit of option to think about business school as well. Um, I could have thought about going to London, which is a more flexible, um, you know, hiring market, uh, especially having just an undergrad degree and McGill being pretty well perceived as an institution there. I could have leveraged that and I could have tried to you know, just bounce back in London. Um, but I didn't really think of it, my, you know, um, having had my stint in the US. I just picture I would just go back to, to Europe and I applied to master's degree in that MBA just because the European market actually, specifically the French market is very much focused on master of sciences rather than MBAs. Right. Uh, we do have good MBAs, like, you know, HSC is a good one, INSET is another good one. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the students are actually not French and, and people who go to say INSET actually don't seek to work in, in France, a lot of them. Um, so HEC, uh, Master's in Science, is much more for people who want to stay local. That's right. Okay. Yep. Okay. So how big, how big was your class, just out of curiosity? Uh, so I joined the last year of what's called the Gronicard Program. Uh, so specifically in the international business class that I was in, we were about 50. But as a, as a graduating class, I joined um, 300 people in their last year of studies, basically. Got it. Okay. So tell me a little bit about kind of that whole transition back to, to Paris and then specifically what you were looking to, to jump into. It sounds like you were aiming for investment banking, but it, you did have a few, uh, you did have an internship in, in private equity, it sounds like as well. So I'd love to hear about kind of what the thought process was coming out of there. Yes. I, as I said, I was, one thing I did enjoy was advisory. I, I did enjoy advising both, uh, you know, large corporates as well as colleagues on, on, I would say financial engineering matters. I, I did like that. Um, uh, th that aspect of the job. Um, and I also did not like work for a big bank, which had a huge trading division. And, you know, I was working in a team which was clearly not at the core of the firm strategy. And it was so much frustrating. Um, so I told myself, all right, I want to focus on advising, but I don't I want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to work for a huge institution in which I'm just a, um, a small number in a, in a big, uh, in a big institution. So um, I somewhat forced myself not to apply to much larger banks, including the JPs and, and, and the Goldman's of this world, which at the time, you know, not all my um, friends agreed with my approach, but I was, I was pretty confident on the back of my New York experience that this is what I wanted to do. Um, I got a few end of studies internships offers. I picked the Blackstone one um, in the restructuring team, which had a really good reputation. Um, again, having done a bit of advisory and a bit of credit advisory, um, I thought restructuring was a diff an interesting area to explore. And this, this was in London. So you were open to and moving to London. London. That's were right. You, you were open to going there if the right opportunity presented itself. So you go, this is called an end of study internship after your master's and it's pretty typical to do one, two, three internship. What, what's, what's typical for, for after that? It's usually standard to do one. Uh, to be frank, people usually try to bank on this one to be the, the last stone to, to their CV and have a very credible CV. Um, in this case, Blackstone it was just a summer internship, uh, which is, I would say, similar to the, um, to the penultimate year uh, summer internship program. Um, in my case, uh, I had done the New York experience um, and, and Blackstone was open also to having um, young graduates um, as, as part of their summer internship program. Um, and you know, this is why, this is why I applied and that's how I got the role and creating my experience in New York in a credit focused role did help, um, definitely did help. And HTC as, as a brand also did help a lot. You know, there's a lot of HTC graduates working in Blackstone. So having, um, the HTC, um, logo on the CV clearly did have, um, a bit of an impact. Do typically, do typically they give you like a full-time offer right after that and you just roll right into it? Yes, so exactly. They usually do accommodate for those. Um, and, uh, you know, usually they give you a couple of months off. Sometimes it's going to be four months, six months. So typically you do a story in the ship and say, we like you. Uh, you're not going to roll back straight into it. But sometimes they do, but that's quite rare. They usually say, start in, come in Jan. Or sometimes you just say, come next year. Uh, you know, come, come, come in June. And you, and you get a vacation? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Before you start, yeah. you know, that's such an awesome like breather right before you started at analyst. That's right. That's right. So tell me, what was it like over the summer there? Like in terms of, I, I worked in restructuring for a couple of years um, back in New York and 
Um, it, it was interesting, the work. I felt like the complex capital structures, all that stuff, the understanding different types of credit was interesting. Were you doing mostly m a or mostly restructuring during that summer? Or was it too I think short? summer was very much m a focused. I got uh, stuffed on a uh, Kikiera-owned uh, German um, company. Um, and uh, we were advising the lead creditor on that um, uh, on that on that role, and it was absurdly complex. Uh, and there was no analyst that worked straight with the associate, who was a senior associate, turning into a VP and an MD. So I got <laughs> I got all the exposure in the world. Uh, but it was good. It was good. I learned a ton. And so, did they give you an offer at the end of it, or what do you think happened? So the issue is I got absolutely burned during that time period. Um, I don't really blame it on uh, Blackstone specifically. I think a lot of analysts had left before some internship. So um, a lot of the interns that were in that team got, got burned like like I was. Uh, and so that made me think about whether or not I wanted to do this. What do you mean you got what do you mean you got what do you mean you got burned like uh, during that summer? I worked very, very long hours. Uh, like 120 a week? Like 120 hours a week, you think? Um, yeah, <laughs> something like this. About that. I, uh, I, would, I would finish late, um, start early and work on, you know, the thing, and, and as you know, and, um, restructuring is, there's always a big element of stress, uh, just because everything was due yesterday. Um, and, and especially when you're not yet properly trained, uh, you know, you do get, you do get, uh, a lot of work and because you don't get it around the first time, there's a fair amount of iteration. So, um, as an intern, it was very intense. Um, and in parallel, I was, I had started um, applications for that other European boutique I joined. And so when at the end of the summer, I did get competing offers and decided to go for the other ones than uh, and Max just because I, I, I thought, you know, is this gonna be like this throughout my analyst career or is it not? And the truth is, I could have stayed because uh, I think the hours actually did get better afterwards after they did hire a few analysts. Um, and the other interns that decided to stay um, actually got a more manageable workload going forward. Than, so you, than I did so you did get an offer or you didn't get an offer? We never got to this. I said I got another one, so they never had to offer me one. So got it. So you had another did. one at, at now the, the private equity kind of. No, no, no. I did get uh, the offer at, at the European boutique that was starting in oh, January. Okay. And so I did have a gap. I did have four months of gap between the summer. And you decided and to work. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, I'm going to try private equity because it's sexy. And, uh, and, you know, internships are usually made to know what it is that you want or do not want to do. And I went into private equity to see what it was like. Tell me about that. It was good. Were you burnt out by the time you started there because of because of what happened? <laughs> you went you went back home. You're so you were back in Paris. Exactly. Uh, from I went back home. Uh, I did get two weeks of of holidays in between the end of my internship and my bright equity experience, okay. uh, and that definitely did help. Um, and I think bright equity was really interesting because you could see how some deals, especially on the piece, I tend to be thought out very, you know. Uh, People do think about it very early on. Uh, just the concept of it, you know, a lot of the PE guys do get with a theme, an investment theme or a key topic they just want to have conviction on and they want you to dive in. And so sometimes you're going to do a lot of research way before there's an actual company or way before there's an actual deal to be made. But by the time there's an actionable situation, um, uh, you're ready because you've done some of your DD, you did get some of your data, you did. Uh, and turn some of the stones that you wanted to turn, and so um, you know your 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 investment appetite is is is, uh, is sharper. What was your impression of private equity? Were you saying, "Hey, this is something you might want to do in the future"? Or by the end, you said, "Hey, I'm ready to go to banking." It was twofold. Um, I thought it was a really interesting job, and I could consider it as uh, a career option down the line. I also told myself, um, you know, on the back of what I just said, that. I really like the deal-driven aspect of things, and I, I was frustrated with the slower pace uh, quite a bit, and the fact that you know you had to do those expert calls and do a lot of reading on your own and talk to people way before there was an actual situation. And there was a part of me that was a bit frustrated with that pace. I understand why people do it, and I think it's it's definitely part of the job. It should be part of the job. Uh, but I, you know, banking is a deal-flow-driven um, exposure, and I did, really did like that aspect. So. 
like um, the, the research, know. almost like the research aspect of private equity, where you're digging into a thesis and stuff, that type of stuff didn't appeal to you as much as like the fast paced deal aspect of banking. That's right. That's right. I did like the, the fast paced aspect of deal flow in general. Well, that's good because you had that's what you had an offer for um, come that January. So, so you kind of do you get any time off before your jump from private equity internship? To Not you? a lot, just like a week for Christmas. But the, the story there is I did start a deal um, at Bridgepoint. Uh, you know, the concept of meeting people and putting things on paper. And the moment that that um, transaction went live, I was the analyst on that deal on the advisory side. So I received a lot of the PowerPoints I had prepared during my time as an internship uh, as an analyst. <laughs> Steve, as well. That's amazing. You're like, I know this work product really well. It's, this is genius. <laughs> exactly. That was exactly it. And so that was, that was, for me, that was quite unique. You know, I did see the deal from end to end. You saw it really from end to end, from both sides. Yeah. Um, very cool. Um, so you, okay, so you started at this uh, boutique um, in Paris. So you stay, you're kind of, which is nice, you're kind of near family and everything. Um, tell me a little bit about your analyst stint there and then, you know, why, why transition to London after, to, as for your associate role with another bank? Um, kind of with a thought process around that. I, I don't want to keep it too much longer. I know you've been on for a while. No, no, that's fine. Um... I really like um, working there. Uh, I was exposed on a wide variety of topics across industries, across M&A, across financing, across restructuring. I worked on restructuring of a large listed company, on the project finance re refinancing of a big toll road in France, on a lot of the sell sites and buy sites. So I got to see very, you know, very different situations. And I could have stayed there. I did enjoy my time. The one thing that was driving me potentially out was uh, the international component. Uh, international you know, component, you said? Yeah, the international. Okay. It was a really good bank in Paris, but I was speaking French all day. And I told myself, you know, I'm 26, uh, 27. Um, I'm still young. I could be, and I'm more, really, it's easier for me to go places now than it will be even a couple of years down the line. So I told myself, you know, uh, if you are to go somewhere, do it now. I did actually, you know, start discussions with that boutique on uh, going to other offices, either in New York or London. And they did say, you know, yes, that's definitely feasible, but it's going to take, you know, maybe another uh, 18 months to two years. And, and I was telling myself, yeah, actually, I think I want to do it now. And and then I got headhunted um, for a role for that uh, American boutique, which, you know, I like the brand. The role was uh, really what I was looking for. And the people that I met there, it just, it was really a, a good match. Um, and very made the transition a lot easier when I did tell myself before I didn't want to jump. Um, I didn't want to change. Peaks. Um, I thought the one I was in was really good. And then when I met those people, I told myself, all right, I think this is it actually. Yeah. So you, so you made the, after two and a half years as an analyst, you kind of made that jump from Paris to London now speaking almost all English. That's right. Um, no, that's it's, right. A, I mean, it's a big switch. Jackson, it's still there, but, um, but yeah, it was good. I think London, London is a very good place for international carriers overall. You get people from across Europe uh, and, of course, from the UK and from other jurisdictions. And up until recently, you know, London still, still is the case, but um, was, you know, London is the core place for deal flow for continental Europe. So deals that get done out of, uh, you know, Germany or Spain may sometimes be partially done out of and then you do see a huge deal flow, which is not just UK driven. The second aspect, which I, I'm going to briefly mention is that, and that was very restructuring focused, is that the London market, uh, and that was pre-Brexit, uh, because a lot of the, um, I would say, loans and LBO finance that is drafted under UK law, and because the jurisdiction and the law that is in place is very structured and well-tested, most of the restructuring done for Europe was done out of London. So the lawyers, the bankers, the hedge funds uh, were in London. And, um, and so mechanically, a lot of the deal flow was, there was an outsized share for London for restructuring compared to the rest of Europe. That's going to change with Brexit now that, um, you know, uh, UK law may not be recognized by other courts anymore. So that, that may be a big change. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. So you were doing kind of a 
sounds like a lot of restructuring as an associate. Tell me a little bit about the transition from analyst to associate after. So you've done two and a half years at one boutique. Did they accelerate your promotion? You, did you jump? Did you join as an associate or did you have to do a I little joined bit as of an associate as a year, which was a bit of a jump, but not a big jump because it was three and a half year associate cycle. So, you know, uh, not, not a massive jump. Um, so someone in line and it did account for the fact that it did have a full year of analyst role in New York. Yeah. And did you, did you, um, when you're, when you were an associate there, did you like, were you still doing, it was still small teams, right? So you were still probably getting your hands dirty in the model and all that stuff from time to time. Yeah. (laughs) So tell me a little bit about that whole thing and then how you, um, you know, you were an associate for three and a half ish years, let's call it before kind of getting promoted. And then with the promotion, you again, jumped to a different city. Tell me what that does. Tell me about that decision. Was it again around wanting that international exposure and want to get to, to New York? Yes, very much so. I think um, so there's a few questions in there. The first one on just um, the associate transition, I think that was the toughest one for me, to be frank, just because suddenly you do have uh, people to actually manage. It's not just interns, which you know you have sometimes for a couple of weeks during the summer internship program. This time you do have analysts working for you on a deal team and you know, manage the workload, the quality of the work and training, coaching, managing expectations was a big uh, change for me. Um, I did have interns when I was an analyst um, in, in Paris uh, working with me, um, but that was that was a very different change. And the first six months were quite a transition on that front because you get a, I think a lot of people, I mean, I think that's quite natural, but you assume that people think, understand and work the same way you comprehend you know, orders from either the clients or your MDs. Uh, and the truth is that's not always the case. So learning about communication was a big, the first six months were, you know, quite, quite a transition. Especially um, since you were now all English from, from French too. to English. It's like that adds an extra complexity, right? Like the. No, for sure. And so there's the, the accent aspect of things and language. And then there's the culture aspect in which in the UK in general, people are much softer. And even when, they're not happy with your work, et cetera. You don't say it, you know, in a, in a straightforward way. You will take a few angles to to explain, yeah, this is not what I had in mind. Uh, we should rethink this, et cetera, instead of being very blunt. And people in Paris were very blunt about you know, what they wanted did not. So I did it come off as blunt, I would say, at the very beginning. Uh, and again, I think the first three to six months where that you weren't transition. polished or soft enough for the London. You were a little bit uh, rough around the edges. They'll call you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Tell, me, okay. you, tell it, me with the transition to New York, the trans, did you fit right in the transition to New York? You felt like it was rough and tumble again. People were very direct in New York or no. No. Um, I think, you know, so the, the, the boutique I work for um, is, has one really great quality, which is culture. Overall, there is across offices across the globe, you know, from the Paris to the Madrid to the London to the New York office, uh, people are all uh, all have the same code when it comes to culture, which is about respect, which is about grooming people, which is about not uh, throwing people down a pit and hoping that they survive, and and that creates for a much much more um, I don't know collegial collegial example uh, collegial um, atmosphere. And so that made the transition from London to New York actually quite smooth, to be frank. Um, I thought I didn't notice a huge difference. Yes, people can be a bit more, I would say, blunt in New York, but uh, but there's no, yeah, there's no harsh attitude at all. Um, great. Yeah. That's great. And yeah, and you've been now in lockdown for about a year <laughs> in New York. Tell me about that. Tell me about, you know, being, I've heard it's really tough because, especially as a VP, all the new analysts that probably joined you in the summer or associates and you've never even met some of them, right? In person or have you, I mean, it's all been Zooms and Skypes or what, yes. whatever you guys use. So tell me how you tried to like actually adjust it because I know a lot of analysts are quitting at a very high rate. At least we're seeing it on the boards on Wall Street Oasis. They're quitting or they're burnt out or they feel lost. They don't feel like they're getting that kind of, they don't have an associate right next to them that they are a fellow analyst that knows how to do something that they can just hop over. So I think they're losing out on a big part of the analyst experience. Have you seen that with uh, your ranks and your juniors? So I didn't get the sense that there was a lot of people, um, you know, very frustrated. Um, with you did, you did or you did not? Leave. No, I did not. I did, did not. not. Okay. I did not hear about people early frustrated about it. That being said, 
uh, I still think the exposure aspect is is a big element, and uh, and I do agree with you. I think one thing we learned somewhat throughout last summer was that we actually do need to over communicate, especially as you know associates and 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 VPs with um, with analysts. I remember at, when I was an analyst, I was on the stool all the time. Like my associate would be like, "All right, come here," and he would model in front of me, uh, and he would be saying, "All right, I do this like this," and I always make sure of that because that's my check here, else it busts the model. And doing this on screen sharing is possible, but it's just that much trickier. Um, I think one thing we learned was that we need to over communicate and never really assume that people do have, you know, the skill set out front, uh, ready to ready to get stuff done the right way. So to your point, I think uh, it's frustrating not to have the collegial aspect, especially with the junior team. And two, when it comes to training, um, you know, we do weekly uh, or bi-weekly Zoom sessions on specific topics. Uh, we do make ourselves very much available for, um, I would say, side chats for brief people. And then when on live execution, when we want to teach someone, we usually try to over communicate. We say, all right, you do we want to do this together and we can do screen sharing and you voice out loud what it is that you're working on and I can I can try to I can try to see. Interesting. Not, not so, it's always possible, right? When you're in rush hour, but uh, when you can, you, you try to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So like you'll actually th there is, that is going on, the screen sharing and the people like walking through models yeah, together. Yeah. It's just exactly. hard to see their faces, right? To see if they're actually getting it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the moment there's a screen sharing, you you yeah, you give up the, the whole They're like they're like this, they're like sleeping on the desk now. <laughs> yes. that's right. So that's great. Well, um, thank you for sharing your story. Tell me a little bit anything else that you feel like is important to share with the listeners or any advice or um, you know, you've you've seen a lot of different cities, you've now seen three or four, no, five different firms in finance from your internships and your, your banking career. Um, yeah. Any, I mean, any overarching advice? Then, uh, you know, made me happy in the job that I'm in right now. Uh, one is culture. Um, it sounds quite a big cliche and I think it's hard to grasp that when you're on, on the outside, but um, enjoying your work is, is part of the dynamic uh, and the attractions you have with your colleagues and the overall, I would say, corporate culture, and that made a big difference. I'm happy in my role right now, uh, thanks to that culture, which is about, uh, you know, you're being tested, but you're also being tested so as to progress, and people will uh, will make you want to progress. So that, that, that was a big driver, and I think when you do find a place that do value you as a future, you know, you're always tested at the next level, and that aspect, I think, is quite, uh, is quite appealing. That's definitely something I do like about banking in general. The second aspect is, you know, the international aspect, especially for, we say, North American grads who have the biggest U.S. financial markets in, you know, in the world, um, waiting for them to, to get started. So it, it's easy to think that um, there's not a whole lot happening in the world. The truth is there is, um, clearly not to the same scale, but there is. And to the extent that you can, especially when you work for the larger banks, well, actually, even for the boutique, for that matter, uh, but even when you work for JP and, and the likes, um, considering doing a rotation for, you know, not long, maybe a couple of years, one, two years uh, to London, Paris, or any other city. Uh, that's definitely, I think, something you should um, try to capture um, or focus on if you can in your, in your early years, just because you, you can. Interesting. Yeah. Before you have a family and that's right. tied down. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, Charles, thanks so much for sharing your story. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, patrick at wallstreetoasis.com. Until next time.